Hello, everybody. It's Colleen Pearl, the Cool Crone, and Gerald from Tarot Stash. And we're here today to discuss Ostara. Um, hi, Gerald. Hi. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. I adore these conversations. I know. I do, too. I really look forward to them. It's weird. It's like you get a bunch of shows set up. And every once in a while, I'm just like, oh, I got to get home. I have a show. Oh, and there's this rush. But having these shows and not having to rush home from work is just like very, very enjoyable. I yeah. agree. And and I like talking about Wheel of the Year stuff because it happens every year. Mm -hmm. And right. invariably, I am learning something each time I have a conversation yeah. with you, with people in the chat. It's really great. It's great. Yeah, it is great. It's um, that that. Well, that's the thing is that learning about this stuff learn is also learning about yourself and your response mm -hmm. to this stuff. And that is the witch's journey, really. I mean, you're you're. It's a lifelong study because you're changing, your surroundings change, things change in your friends' lives, things change in the world, and you're always learning and adapting to whatever that change is. And yes. that's, I think that's exciting. And there's so many different ways to study about the the seasons of the year or the wheel of the year. You can do it from the farmer's almanac. Yeah, I did for a long time. Yeah. Um, astrologically, you can get curious. You can do your favorite internet search. You can get a metaphysical book. You can pay attention to whatever topic you want. Um throughout the year and you're going to learn something because it's so very it's incredible that way yeah it's incredible yeah i agree i think a good study for anyone is to like I, i'm i'm not good at doing this myself but i do think for people who can do it it's really important <laughs> but if you want to really get in touch with all of the sabbats keep a yearly journal yes you know, you might, you might even include, you know, when the full moon hits or when the new moon hits. And it's not important to know the astrology behind it. It's important that you note how you feel. So you can just say, you know, March, full moon, how do I feel? Or what's going on? What's a big, you know, landmark, mm -hmm. or milestone going on in your life? And then you can look back and kind of get an overview of, you know, how you do things. Did you progress in any areas? Did, you know, because it, it'll it take you back to where you were at that point in time, a year mm -hmm. ago, nine months ago, six months ago, yes. whatever. I think that's really important. And and that's really, I mean, for, when we were an agrarian society where our survival um, was off the land. Yeah. And we we paid attention to all of these things. Because what happened once before, ooh, that happened um, at spring and this happened. So how do we prepare for that? Mm -hmm. So we we bring forth. And that's when when the elders uh, of, of societies would say, okay, this is what's there. This is the sign. Pay attention to this. We need to prepare. And it's it's really, really beautiful really yeah. so very important yeah and because we are not an agrarian society anymore it's even more important as witches and light workers to pay attention to the world around us and mm -hmm. that means the weather the seasons changing your changes like for a lot of people they have allergies right so mm -hmm. and when does that happen is that year round is that only a particular season you know um when kids go back to school, that's a season. That's right around mm -hmm. the fall equinox. Um, you know, we do have myriad religions that have big holy days in December around the winter solstice. So that's yes, a big season. Yes. And we do have other holidays that kind of, you know, form a traffic jam around certain times of year because it's coming from, I think, those agrarian roots, you mm -hmm. know that those societies also had to really pay attention to uh, what was going on with their food supplies and their crops yes. and their bringing in the water and making the mead and making the beer and, you know, preparing for things. And while we can just, you know, run to Walmart whenever we want to yes. in the past, you couldn't do that. So I mean, yeah. COVID taught us though, 
sometimes you can't always run to Walmart. You know, sometimes you do have yes, to really that think is so about true. your life. That is so true. I'm, I'm, Colleen doesn't know I'm going to do this, but please leave a comment if you would like Colleen and I to have a conversation about answering the question, what is a witch? What does it mean to be a witch? And I also, I think it'd be great to converse with you about the moon phases. Sure. So sure. if yeah. you want that, let us know, mm -hmm. let us know. Because, well, and I can say for me personally, especially around the equinoxes, um, my, my care for my diabetes is different. Oh. Because it, I, I noticed that probably about 20 years ago, why is, am I having to do things differently? And it's like, oh, it's because, I mean, it literally happened at the spring and the uh, autumnal equinoxes. It's like, I don't know why it is what it is. Yeah. And I prepare for it. Very good. So, wow. So, but yeah. Wow. That's and, uh, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it surprised me to be honest with you. And yeah. this was before I officially started studying. It was like, wow, it's around Easter and it's a uh, you know around fall. Huh. And it's like I I don't know. That's just how my body and how my energy works. That's so interesting. So, do you feel like you need less care on your diabetes during that time, or more care? I need more care for, um, it's, it's actually been happening. It's a, it's about two and a half to three weeks with the solstice being in the center yeah. to where my, the, the way I normally manage needs to be adjusted. I need to eat. I need to eat differently. I need to eat less. Uh -huh. So it's just like, huh? So it's very, very interesting. Wow. That is that is really, really fascinating. So. And, you know, I what well, we were just talking about backstage, one thing that, and, and folks, we will get to us, Ostara. This is all about Ostara oh, yeah. is, is you know, new beginnings and, and, you know, it's not about little chicks and ducks, but, you know, we'll talk about all of that. Yes. But, but talking about um, self-care and what we need to do just to take care of ourselves, we, we were discussing that, um, a really good thing to do just in general for your spiritual journey, for your own physical and mental, emotional journey, and just to get to know yourself, which is really the witch's task to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's really good to keep a journal um, and just note how you feel in each month and yeah. how you feel around the full moon and the new moon. Just that, just that little bit of information it's really, really good to look back on after about a year or even like nine or 10 months, just to begin to see, are there, are there patterns that you see? You don't, you don't need to equate it to the astrology necessarily. Although later on you could take it to somebody who knows astrology and they could plot it out for you and say, yeah, you know, when the moon is full in the, in the uh, warmer months, you, ex you did this. And when the moon is full in the cooler months, you did this or something like that. I don't know. I'm just kind of giving hypotheticals, but that, that um, your own journaling and narrating of your journey through the months and the full and new moons can tell you a tremendous amount about who you are as a person. And it also just might encourage you to meditate, which I think everybody should. So <laughs> It's really, really good. I feel called out, Colleen, because, you know, I always struggle with that. But. A lot of people do. That's yes. why I keep saying it. Well, and I also love that idea is, is when we, when you notice what happens for you, you can, you can use that to your advantage. Yes. Because um, I learned recently in the conversation about astrology with someone is, you know, a lot of people talk about Mercury retrograde. Well, depending upon where Mercury falls in your chart, that retrograde may be a great time for you to do certain tasks and certain things. So you're going to know what works for you because me, um, new moons do, do not impact me. No, full moons don't impact me like they impact everybody else. So, I mean, my, my stuff is the... <laughs> 
it's the new moon. Wow. Were you born on a new moon? I think I was born on a... Do I have your chart? I think you gave You probably it. do. I think it was born on... I was either born on a waxing or a waning, so some sort of a crescent. I can't remember. Okay. I have your chart. I'll just take a look really quick. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a waxing. It was... No, it was a waning moon. It was a waning moon. It was a cross-quarter waning moon because... It, no, it wasn't cross-quarter. It was in trying to the sun. So, yeah, it was pretty positive. So you're saying that the full moons don't impact you? Not, not that I've noticed. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so it's just, it's, it's one of those things that when we notice the rhythms, mm -hmm. it's so, it's so empowering when we want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. we want it to be. And you, and you don't see any difference between particular full or new moons? Not that I've noticed. Wow, that's really interesting. Because your sun and your moon are in great harmony in your chart. Oh, and, exactly. and your moon is in the in your first house, and it's um, it's right in the center of right. Yeah, it's pretty much in the center of Cancer, and uh, you have Cancer rising. Hang on a second. Let me go back and. Uh, <laughs> And by the way, I see everybody here and thank you. We do like the little headdresses. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And um, we, we didn't plan this, but we each showed up and we had it. Yeah. It's funny. It's fun, really funny. We just kind of all of a sudden, boom, here we are. That's good. I just want to put this in the, uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't do this making everybody wait, but it's okay. But, but I, so I'm just catching up on some of the chat because, okay. um, you know, and um, Plucky Heroin is here. Thank you. Loves these Wheel of the Year conversations. Me um, too. I do too. I do too. I always go away and learn something. Yeah, me too. And I was thinking, you know, this is, I think, was Ostara the first one we ever did? Because I think we did Ostara last year. We, uh, we might have. I would have to go back and look. Yeah, I think we did. I think Ostara might have been the first one that we did last year. Um, and that's what got me thinking at the end of the year, 2023, I was thinking, well, what, what are we going to do to change it up just a little bit? And we have lots of ideas for adding in, you know, different oh, conversations yeah. and stuff. So we'll, we'll just keep doing this because it's fun. Yeah. You're, you're stuck with us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. We're here. Yeah. Yeah. Your moon has this beautiful trine with the sun. So, you know, your, uh, your personality is very, very well integrated and very well integrated with how you present yourself to the oh, world. Right. Very sensitive, caring, all these beautiful water signs. But a lot of, you know, you got you got that trine with Saturn too. So that's very mm -hmm. integrative with discipline <laughs> and and structure. I, I, I do like me some structure, especially when I've set it up and everybody has to follow it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Bemused um, shaman said it takes time to study how the seasons pass and what is expressed um, my nature and the elements in your area. Erin Kenny's wonderful book about Vashon Island, uh, that's for the Pacific Northwest, is a good example. Oh, wow. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, Bemused shaman. I'm well acquainted with Vashon Island. I spent a lot of my childhood there. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful place. Um, oh, yeah. Cool. So okay. I've distracted Colleen with astrology. That's okay. So, um, and by the way, you know, I'll do the plug for her. You can you can get an astrology reading from Colleen, and actually, it now would be a really good time to get one, wouldn't it? Yeah, really good time to get one because we've got. Um, I mean, uh, we've got the two eclipses coming up, but it's really kind of. The, the Zodiac's new year, you know, coming into Aries. Mm -hmm. That's the first sign yeah. and everything. And I'll um, do that. Know your limits, purchase responsibly, here to share, not to sell. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Because, you know, April, most of the month of April is going to be spent in Mercury retrograde, which is going to be so fun. And um, <laughs> yeah, even that April 8th eclipse, that's happening during the Mercury retrograde. And it's a really powerful eclipse. But um, all of the eclipse energy for this season, for the spring season, is about letting things go and letting new things start up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever you're doing, if you're cleaning out closets or cleaning out relationships or 
you know, whatever you got before you can start that new thing, you need to get rid of some junk. Yes. Just remember that. Yes. Well, and that's one of the key things about Ostara or the vernal equinox. It's when light and dark are equal. So in, in my practice, I pay attention to what I'm, what, where is my energy going now? Because that's what I'm going to be putting energy into for the next six months. Yeah. Uh, am I wanting to draw things toward me? Am I wanting to grow things? Am I wanting to clear things out? Uh, it doesn't matter. It's just where I place my attention because this is a perfect time. Things are in balance. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to, where do you want to put your energy? So do yeah. pay attention to that. Yeah. And, and if you're getting the urge that like, you know, you can't stand to go past a certain room because it's so messy maybe that's telling you that you need to do something about that oh, yes. or, or you can't stand to go into work because of that. This one person that always comments on the time of day that you're arriving, arriving or something, maybe you need to have a conversation with them very gently and ask them to not do that. <laughs> it <Yes. bothers> you. <laughs> you know, letting things go, releasing things, banishing things. Um, I think even setting boundaries is kind of letting things go because it's, letting go of you allowing other people to disabuse you, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's, or to abuse you. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, there's so many ways to express it. It can be on the micro level. It can be on the macro level. Ooh, mm -hmm. I my crown. <laughs> I didn't want to hit my microphone because then it, you hear a big boom, you know? <laughs> well, and, and, and it is really important. Those boundaries Clear boundaries are a wonderful way for self-care. Yeah. Because you know what you will accept and what you won't. And if something goes around that or comes close to it, you know you can say something. And if it's passed, you're done. Yeah. You're done. And I think that's so important for people who have been raised believing that they just have to cater to everybody else's needs. Yes. And that can be male or female. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You know, if you have been raised to think that things are your fault or that you have to clean up after other people yeah. or that it's your responsibility to make sure that people like get to their appointments on time or do their homework or get to their job or have their meals made or make their lunch or take their lunch or fill up the car with gas, that those are not your jobs really. But if you've been raised mm -hmm. to believe that, you may think, oh, well, she's not really talking to me. No, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Those of you who are, yes. you know, just way, way overdoing for other people. It's just mm -hmm. not necessary, you know, unless they're small children. And even small children need to be taught independence and what their boundaries are too, I believe. That's just my opinion. I, I agree with you because we learn how to take care of ourselves, to set boundaries and how to behave by those around us all eyes are watching us yes and so you know when we when we speak our truth and we speak it clearly and we explain what is going on and why even if it's a difficult conversation especially when it's a difficult conversation <laughs> yeah yeah it, it really helps i mean and this is this is a perfect time to have this conversation because this is what's really coming into into life and coming to the light here in the, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, we're looking at going into spring. Yeah. So, and in the Southern Hemisphere, they're, um, you know, they're Mabon or Mabon um, is the autumnal equinox. So they're moving into the darker part of the year. Northern Hemisphere is the lighter part of the year. Right. So. Right. That's right. So, yeah. And. I'm going, I'm going to do that thing where I hold up a chart. Yay. So this is the wheel of the year. This is Yule or December. And here um, we have the spring equinox. And this is the equinoxes where there's equal night and equal day. And here is the solstices where we have long night and long day. So we are coming up right here to where from here, then we're going to be moving to Beltane uh, and to Letha, Lamas, 
were all, you know, the, the light parts of the year. So if you wanted a feeling of where we are, that's where we are. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're over here getting ready to enter here. So. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. And, it, and it's good to note, too, that we're, as far as the um, movement of the year, for a lot of people, this is the beginning of the year. This mm -hmm. is the beginning of feeling like, okay, I can go outside again. I can open my doors again. I can open the windows. I can clear things out. There's a reason why people do spring cleaning. <laughs> you know? Yes. I mean, in, in the... Um, Judaic tradition, there are holidays for this. I think it's Purim that part of getting ready for the holiday or part of the holiday actually is cleaning out your cupboards in your kitchen, getting rid of expired yeah. foods, getting rid of anything that has spilled, cleaning it up and uh, just, you know, making sure also that people in the community have food, not giving them their expired food, but just once they clean up their kitchen and they have things squared away, then making sure that other people mm -hmm. have food. It's a, it's a really great tradition, actually. It really it's, is. It's taking care of your food stuff for you, your family, and then the greater family. I just mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful tradition. And then they, they try to, they, <laughs> when I was living in Brooklyn, I was living amongst the Orthodox um, Hasidim. And they build these little um, structures out on there. They, they all had little balconies on their houses mm -hmm. on the second or third floor. And they built little structures over the balcony so that they could eat outdoors. Yes. And I was like, well, it needs to be outdoors. Why are you putting a roof over it? But it, it was a little cool. It, that, that was the expectation. A little bit cooler, yes. A little bit too cool to be out there. But And they would decorate it with all sorts of, and I'm, p please excuse me if I'm conflating with this with some other holiday. I'm pretty sure, though, that this is the spring one. Um, but they, um, it, it's just a really nice thing. They would invite people who are not um, Hasidic to, to their home to share the food. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely tradition. Really lovely. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm, now I have to look it up because I'm pretty sure yeah, I completely agree with the pooch on that. <laughs> and, and by the way, the best chatters are having great uh, conversation. Um, and so, you know, people are talking about boundaries and you and setting those boundaries and working hard on those boundaries with the support of professionals and people who get it. Um, so there's there. And um, I do have to put this up. Liberal Linda said, Gerald, your charts and signs you hold up add so much to in your videos. Thanks for them. Oh, You're good. Welcome. Good, good, good. You're welcome. And um, and so it is one of those things. Oh, and Bemused Shaman said, I often, I'm often quizzing the woman that owns the plant nursery about what to grow and when. My husband loves leaving butterfly uh, drinking places in the garden. I love that. Oh, I love that. That's really great. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so Wikipedia is not going to tell me too much about the local traditions, but I'm, I'm going to stick to my story. And yes, it is Purim and it's celebrated around March 24th, which would be just a couple of days after the, um, uh, yeah. after the um, vernal equinox, but the, you know, Wikipedia is not like, canon for Jewish understanding. And so what I think what they're missing here is that actually like the week before Purim is when they start the cleaning and the giving and the, you know, making sure that food is distributed and inviting. And then they, um, then they have people to their little, their little place out on the lanai. <laughs> well, and that's, I mean, and part of that is a community. Yeah. Because I think instinctually, and, and, you know, and this is just what Gerald thinks. We are a pack society. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, you know, back in the day, we needed to have that in order to survive. Uh, and, and now, yes, there are, there are introverts and extroverts. However, grouping together, we have a whole lot of power. Because yeah. a lot of these harvest celebrations that we've talked about and we'll talk about again, it's when people show up and you go, okay, your, your, your crops are ready to harvest. Let's all work together and help you. And so you're done now. We're going to help me 
And then we're going to share that food with everybody. So everyone survives. So yeah. Yeah. My, um, my maternal grandfather had a very large farm in Iowa. And so when I was growing up on summers, I would, I would go and stay on his farm and, um, it, it was it was a really fun time of my life. It was really mm-hmm. fun. But he would tell me stories about, you know, how everybody got the harvest done. So he was born, I believe, in 1890. So as he was um, taught how to do farming, he actually went to school for farming, which was pretty unusual back then, but he did. And um, so he knew, you know, how critical it was, the timing of harvest, the timing of planting, all this stuff, the timing was so critical. And he had a, he was good at organizing things. He was a Capricorn too. And so he would kind of have a big hand in, as he got older, he had more of a big hand, but as a young farmer, even he was brought in because of his education to help all the other farmers kind of organize, when are we going to take all of our people and go to this person's farm and this person's farm and this person's farm. And they organized it obviously by a calendar, you know, like, after all the cattle have calved, then, you know, you do this. And then after, when you have to drive the cattle to auction, you do this because you need help. You know, most of the farming activities were handled by him and one other guy. And once in a while, they'd have a couple of other people. But um, when it came to the big things like harvest and Mm -hmm. um, even calving, if you have 16, you know, cows giving birth, you need a little help. You can't be everywhere, you you know? And so they would do that with the, um, especially the harvest, the hay, the corn, the peas, the soybeans, the oats, you know, whatever they were growing, they, you know, they had to harvest and it was really, really important, critical really to their survival Mm -hmm. for their survival. It was a financial survival, not necessarily that they were just growing their own food. Although they did have a house garden, you know, and they yes. ate from the house garden. There wasn't a lot of canned goods around. No, you know? so that's no not unless you canned it and you did your own canning. And my grandmother did, you know, they had a, the, the house was on top of a cellar and the cellar was a cold cellar and it was that so way so that they could, you know, keep everything through the winter. And um, I tried doing that when I lived in Brooklyn and that's when I was living in the midst of this Hasidim uh, community, not mm-hmm. that they uh, embraced me at all. I mean, I was persona non grata, complete. Uh-huh. I'm complete shiksa. So, you know, I'm not, not an acceptable, you know, person, but that was just the location of where we lived. I had to shop everywhere else, but I did have a garden in my backyard, which was really difficult to put in. But anyway, that's another story. Anyway, so we had a garden. And um, the couple of years that I that I was there, I managed to um, put up and can tomato sauce and mm-hmm. uh, we didn't can corn. We just ate it all because it was so good. Oh, so you know, good. Like that's yeah. But we grew, you know, onions and basil and stuff. And that all went into the sauce. So we had my spaghetti sauce. And then I got so brave, I decided I was going to get peaches and can them. And I actually did it. I can't believe it. Because I don't like fresh peaches. I like canned peaches. <laughs> I don't know, I'm weird. There's just something weird about the skin or something. Once I get mm-hmm. rid of that, then I'm much better. But I actually did it. It is a lot of work. It is. A, it really is. A lot of work. Mm-hmm. I had great admiration for my grandmother and my mother after that. Well, and part of that is, is it, it is a lot of work. And when you share it, many hands make light work. Yes. So, I mean, that's really, really critical. It is critical. Really critical. And, it, and it really helps you, you know, there's something to be said about working in that group. It allows you to kind of um, drop your ego and just bring to the table what you can bring. Yes. And that I think is so important. It isn't about who's, who's the best hay baler or who puts up the most tasty spaghetti sauce. It isn't about that. When you're trying to do those big, big group things that are time critical It's just important that everybody works together. Yes. And that's something I think we've really lost in our society. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, because our society is all about me, me, me. And you just go to the grocery store and you order online. And, you know, no wonder so many women resent having to go home and cook dinner after working an eight hour shift. I mean, I was not happy about that. I did (laughs) it, but I was not happy about it. And I certainly divorced that guy as soon as I could, you know. (laughs) 
Thank yes, you. Oh, you're a fan. Oh, it's the Ostara fan. I love it. It okay. is. I got it because it was uh, color appropriate. Oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think you know, I'm I don't hate cooking, but I'm I prefer to bake and you can't bake a dinner. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can, but it would be very starch yeah. heavy. Um, it so, would be starch heavy. So cooking was like I had to learn to to cook for my both my husbands. I had to learn to cook the cuisine they liked. Give me a break, you know. Like if you like it so much, just cook it yourself. And both of them did cook the cuisine they liked, and they both insisted that I had to learn it so that I could cook for them. I was very resentful of that, and I was not bold enough to set down my boundaries and just say, no, I'm working eight hours a day. You go, mm -hmm. you come home and cook it after your eight hour day. Well, yeah, that I wish I had done that, but you know, it all worked out for the best because they were both turned out to be kind of assholes and I'm glad I'm not married to either one of them anymore. But um, <laughs> the thing, what the thing is, is that I don't think I'm atypical. I think a lot of women, um, I'm a boomer. I'm, you know, 67 years old. So a lot of people in my generation, just, you just didn't speak up. You just didn't yes. make that claim. I tried, but I was so ineffectual at it, possibly because I believed deep down that they were right, that I should just do it. Mm. You know? So those days are done. This conversation has deviated into a whole yes. other thing. That so has one can always roast their veggies. Yeah, and I do that now. Me and my daughter um, take great delight in roasting vegetables because we really love them. We eat, eat a lot more vegetables that way. Yeah. Well, okay, so this is Ostara or the vernal equinox. This is when there is equal light and equal night. So, um, and so it's the beginning. It's oftentimes it's called the spring starts. It's yeah. when spring starts. Spring actually really started at Imolk. Yes. Um, and uh, so this is mid spring. <laughs> yeah. <it laughs> because really when is. we yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's 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 that. And this is the time, as Colleen said and said so well, we're we're getting out, we're dusting the things, we're we're clearing stuff out, we're it's it's getting lighter. And we're feeling good. We're starting to go outside. Somebody mentioned in the chat that they were eating their lunch outside. Wow. And, and that in and of itself, being out in nature and having that wind is extremely, extremely helpful um, because um, it, it, it's, it's really about the time when we renew ourselves. What are we going to do for ourselves? That's that idea of our thoughts. We're going to start putting in, you know, the plans for the garden because that's what we've done when it's been dark out. Okay, what are we going to do here? What are we going to do here? Um, you know, six weeks ago, a lot of the seed catalogs were coming out. Yep. Perfect yep. timing for that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start something new, if you want to start a new habit, this is perfect, a perfect time to do it. Um, and and it's also a perfect time if you want to do a ritual or some sort of promise to yourself, spell working for your self-improvement, your overall well-being. I mean, it's perfect for that because this is about definitely taking care of, you're planting the things, you're, you're, you're welcoming spring, you're welcoming this, you're really, um, you're, you're, you know, I want to say sloughing off the winter and the coldness of winter. So, and um, I think it's really so very important. So. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I just went on my little thing there. Oh, I love it. It's great. I'm just trying to find the perfect emoji to come back to cat mama. Sorry. <laughs> well, and, okay. And so this is where let's, let's think about this. I, you know, the perfect emoji, real life, real life. People. Yeah. <laughs> Um, real life. But, you know, I think one of the key things that I like people to think about is, um, you know, I work with color. I'm an artist and all of the colors are around all of the year. Just notice what variation of the color wheel is going on right now. So in chat, when you look around, what types of colors are you seeing? 
I mean, you're seeing you're seeing pinks, you're seeing yellows, you're seeing purples, light blues. You're seeing those beautiful pastels. And um, in in my practice, I can pair the um, spring equinox in um, to dawn of the day. You know, so it's the time of the dawn for the season. So the sun is coming up. So it's that beautiful, bright, it's that refreshed, it's that, um, how do you describe it? It's that, um, you know, there's that dew on the ground and it's, it's very refreshed. Yeah. So, yeah. so notice those colors around you. So. I came home from work on Wednesday and I got out of my car and I hobbled up to my back door and I was stunned by little baby crocuses that came up with out of nowhere. And this year they came up in kind of, a, I have kind of a separation from the end of my driveway into my backyard. I have a little gravel bed because we put the trash cans and stuff out there. They were popping up out of the gravel and there were more this year than I've ever seen. Wow. And there were little pockets of bright purple and little pockets of, you know, beautiful white with the yellow edges. And I was just, I just had to stop for a minute and go, oh, that, that is a feast for my senses. I love that. I was like, I, oh, I love that. We're really in spring. We're really in spring. And that's why, you know, yeah, it's not the beginning of spring. It is mid spring. Otherwise those crocuses wouldn't be up. You that's know? right. Yeah. Yes. And um, here, here where I live, we have this old wives tale that says, you know, there's three snows after the forsythia blooms, which forsythia, bright, beautiful yellow uh, flowers, and then it greens. Um, so about almost two weeks ago, I saw my four, first forsythia blossom. And then the next day we had a snow. So we're, I'm expecting two more snows. But these days, I don't know if that'll actually happen. Yeah. I don't know if that'll actually happen. So, but yeah. Um, so uh, again, you know, there's a, um, with Ostara, I'm going to let you, do, do you want to talk about this idea of the, um, the rabbit and goddesses associated with Ostara or anything like that? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess we could. I could just give the Reader's Digest version, though. I'm I'm not prepared to do a whole thing on it, which is probably mm -hmm. good for today. We're already on 37 <laughs> minutes. So, um, sure. So, Iostra was um, one way of naming that goddess. And mm -hmm. I believe that she really kind of morphed out of a Norse goddess originally that did. And I can't remember the Norse goddess's name, but she had she had rabbits in some fashion working with her and that morphed into a goddess called that they called Eostra. Yes. Are you thinking the um, goddess of Frigg? Yes. 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 That's the one. That's yep. the one. And were the, were the, they were hairs for Frigg, right? And yes. this, they would pull a chariot or something. The Norse people always have chariots going on. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah. Oh, well, of course they do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and of course, Frigga. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Frigga, of course, would have um, you know hairs pulling her. So pulling her, right? And so that that I mean, probably took her a bloody long time to get anywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes. Anyway, oh, yeah. so this this came down to Eostra in the more more Celtic regions of the world, which is where, let's face it, most witches really pull a lot of their. Um, uh, well, all the Sabbath stuff is all pulled out of the more Celtic um, yes. mythologies, probably due to Gerald Gardner. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to blame him for a lot of this stuff. Yes. And um, so they had these, these, um, you know, they had all the Easter stuff, right. That has just kind of overshadowed all the Ostara stuff. But before Easter, there was Eostra and they, um, the eggs were were meant to symbolize fertility and yeah. i think because you have birds laying eggs even i don't know how many chickens were in ireland laying eggs but maybe there's a lot i don't know mm -hmm. um, they certainly didn't color the eggs they just 
Right. We just found eggs that were coming up. It was that time of year. And that's how the egg comes into it. And the hair, the bunnies, really come from Frigg and, and the way the whole identity of the goddess sort of got borrowed from the Norse uh, pantheon. Yes. And so out of those hairs, you know, they be, they were hairs. And if you notice, like in the tales of like Peter Cottontail and the Beatrix Potter ones, those drawings that she does, those bunnies are large. They're very tall, large bunnies. Mm -hmm. She didn't draw just the itty bitty baby ones because those were babies. And babies, baby anything, is very appropriate for Ostara. But yeah. when I think the Eostra mythology was being sort of, I don't know if worshipped the right word, but observed, mm -hmm. I think the rabbits would have been more hair-like. So the longer yeah. bottom feet, the taller body, you know, very long ears, and more going upright a lot. So over time, you know, we get the Catholic Church that's just appropriating all the pagan holidays. They couldn't get rid of everything. They just couldn't no. make it die. They did the whole thing with Jesus and the rising and the yada yada. You guys know that story. I'm sure you can find it on mm -hmm. Wikipedia. Anyway, <laughs> over the years, they were really trying to squelch this and they just couldn't. So after a while, they kind of gave up and they're like, okay, so there's a portion of Easter that has to belong to this Eostra goddess. I don't think they ever wanted to make her a saint or anything like, no. like Bridget, but they allowed for the whole chicks, bunnies, eggs thing to come in. Now, when it got into pastel colors, I'm going to say that probably came from Eostra long ago. Mm -hmm. That was squelched. And that was probably revived like maybe in the Victorian era, I'm going to say, because they were very colorful era. And then Hallmark went bananas with it. Uh, well, yes. Of and course Paz. Is it Paz that makes the dye, the egg dye and everything? Yes. yes. Yeah. But you can just see that um, if you know anything about the Victorian era, era they were big into spiritualism. Mm -hmm. And so doing something that could maybe get their kids into it or just something fun. I mean, Queen Victoria was friggin' crazy with the, with the Victoriana stuff. That's why it's called Victorian, right? Yeah. She, was, she was crazy about uh -huh. you know, weird things. And remember that's a period of time when people used to take pictures with their dead relatives. That's very odd. So it's, it was a very odd time. They just threw yeah. everything into the pot and said, Hey, here's your holiday back. You know, here's your pagan holiday back. And, and a lot of people were just very happy about it because, frankly, Easter, when you think about it, it's real downer. It's just not a happy holiday. It's not. It's, it's not. like, uh, what's the Jewish one? The, uh, Passover. You know, not a happy holiday. You know, people are going like, happy Passover. And I always think, God, that's cruel. Why would you say that to somebody? But yet, yeah, yeah. they've got greeting cards that say it. And it's like... God, you have completely lost the, missed the point of where this is coming from. Yes. So I just think that's nonsense. And you know, if you if you want to dye eggs, dye eggs. It's fine. The symbolism of the egg is a beautiful symbol for Ostara because what's more perfect for renewal than something that's going to be born? And the egg symbolizes the birth, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be a live, well, it's a live birth once it comes out of the egg. But we don't think of things that get born with eggs as a live birth, do we? I, I don't know. Am I wrong about that? I, I, I don't know. Let you know. We're we're not talking politics. No, depending on what state we're in. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to send you out to the field if we're wrong. I just yeah, don't know. Yeah. okay. Okay. <laughs> Eoster. It's E O S T R E. So the E's on the end. So it's kind of like easter but it's a little bit mm -hmm. different and with all of the goddess names there are so many variations so many good variations point. good point yeah so i th i think something you know something you know because one of the great things when i first met jeffrey he was teaching classes about timing of the year oh. and one of the things that he was he talked about is is the goddess ostara or uh you know it's the bird and the bunny and the mm -hmm. idea is, is that um, this goddess was uh, the goddess of dawn and rebirth. Yep. Who was 
responsible for bringing spring each year. She was feeling guilty about arriving so late, and to make matters worse, she arrived to find a pitiful little bird that lay dying, his wings frozen by the snow, and um, Ostara cradled the shivering creature and saved his life. Oh. And so legend had it that she made him her pet, or in the X-rated version, her lover. Um, and um, because he could no longer fly uh, because of the damaged wings, she turned him into a snow hare and gave him the name of uh, yeah. Lepus. Yes. And so she also gave him the ability to run with amazing speed and to honor the earlier aspect of him being a bird, gave him the ability to lay eggs. So there's the connection there. And by the way, yeah. as with everything, um, you know, there was drama. So um, when, when they fell out, she allows um, this hare to return to the earth once a year and to give away his eggs to the children attending the festivals in her honor. And that's, that's part of, part of that. So very nice. Now, you know, very nice. Yeah. I know the, the, I have, I have um, talked about the goddess of Stara also. And I think that that name comes more from like, I want to say like a more like Roman or Greekish, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And, and notice how it's all morphed together, you mm -hmm. know, because they, they, I know, and, and again, yeah, there's 50 bazillion spellings of all this stuff, but we really do have Gerald Gardner to blame for all of this because yes. he really focused things on the Celtic uh, nations that existed in Great Britain, mm -hmm. not even the full Celtic nations, but just the ones in Great Britain, because I think that's where he was from. And even though, you know, a lot of people along the way brought in Egyptian influences and Greek mm -hmm. and Roman influences and all this other stuff, they just were dealing with the, the literature and mythology that, that had they had available. Yes. So whatever was in print at the time of their beginnings, that kind of became the foundation for what most people think of as Wicca now. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, you know, no matter what anybody tells you, unless, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to edit myself. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Okay. It is an amalgam. It is an amalgam of many, many schools of thought. Yes. And, and I personally think when we understand and we appreciate that that's exactly what it is, we can field out and we can get more information to deepen our personal understanding of it. And um, and then we can make our own connections with it. Because Amilda was saying, you know, something new to share with my great niece. I love the idea of creating traditions around these holidays. Create your own traditions. Find out what other people do. Mm -hmm. Do your own. I mean, one of the things that Jeffrey and I have done is uh, at the Vernal Equinox, we will dye yarn that we will use for making things for ritual for our altars nice as gifts and so it's really beautiful if you've got if you've got a um something that you regularly do your tradition mm -hmm. think about it do that honor that because it is part of you know again i'll, I'll here i'll get on my soapbox and say Honor the tradition because part of honoring and remembering your ancestors brings them along with you. Yeah. It strengthens those ties. Yeah. So I love that. I love that. I mean, you know, people, Easter bonnets. I was joking about wearing Easter bonnets because, yes. Oh, here. I should, I should be doing this. Easter bonnets. I have to fix this with my tiny hands. Um, but... But the idea of that is, is we're able to get out of the house. Holy yep. mackerel. This is yep. great. Let's celebrate. Yep. Celebrate and really let that stuff go. It's so, so very incredible. So. Yeah. And Ostara, I think, is a particularly easy one to start with with kids because they do see all the marketing for bunnies and eggs and chicks and all of that stuff around. 
And it's really easy to drop in the mythology about where the goddess, who the goddess is. And it doesn't matter which, how you start, you know, it yeah. really doesn't matter. I mean, uh, someone in the chat uh, was talking about Ishtar from Sumer. I think though, I think, well, maybe not the first goddess, but um, Inanna too uh, yep. was another one that um, all of these things, Inanna, Ishtar, that all kind of turned into Isis and then, um, you know, other goddesses were sparked. Then, you know, every time you turn around, you just bumped into another goddess. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> people like that stuff. Yeah. It really makes them feel comforted <laughs> to have that. But um, yeah, Ostara is a really good one. I mean, Halloween is a little harder with Samhain because it isn't about giving kids candy. It just isn't. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's just not. So that one is a little hard. Yule. Yule is a good one because, um, you know, they have maintained the colors of red and green, which are really colors for Yule. Yes. And the imagery of holly, of um, snow, of crystals, of the coldness. Um, but uh, the evergreen trees, the berries on the holly. I mean, there's a lot of things that are out in the um, media, you know, out in, uh, in mm -hmm. advertising and stuff that kids can resonate to. Um, Beltane, May Day. I mean, in, I remember as a child, we used to make May baskets and put them on people's doorknobs on May 1st. I never did any of that. Yeah, we used to do that. I don't know whether my teacher was a closet pagan or what the deal was, but, <laughs> but we did that. Um, trying to think of any of the other ones. I remember when I first heard about Lamas, I was just dumbfounded. I was like, there's a holiday. Shakespeare talks about Lamas tide. Is that what he was talking about mm -hmm. in Romeo and Juliet? He taught the nurse as a whole thing about Lamas tide. And I was like, that's what it's about. I was really excited to hear that. So that one's kind of a tough sell. But Mabin, when the clocks change, and that's the other thing about Ostara, it's right around the time that the clocks change. When mm -hmm. the clocks change, and then you have, you can see that, you know, um, days are getting shorter and stuff for Mabin, I'm talking about. You know, that one, it's a little odd for kids because they've already started school. So it's not like before yeah. school or anything, but mm -hmm. that's another one you can probably get them in on. So if you're looking at things to do for kids, um, I think really the cross quarter holidays are a little bit easier to get to because they're actually the ones that most people know more about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my advice. Cause I did that with my kids. I, I celebrated those things with my kids. I love that. And they thought I was weird as shit, but that's okay. They don't anymore. <laughs> Your mom, of course you're weird as shit. That's what yeah. happens. Well, yeah, that's true. But no, it was universally accepted around the neighborhood that all the other mothers also thought I was very weird. So <laughs> and I just said, you know what? That's their problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so this is, this is really, I mean, with the goddesses, whichever goddess you want to choose, the colors, looking around in nature is yeah. always a good idea. What is going on around you? We have hyacinths coming up, right? Um, right. We have yeah. um, we have the crocus. We have the daffodils. We have um, sometimes the lilies. But you, you pay attention to the tulips, the things that are in bulbs that are actually blooming. Those are that's what's really important. Notice those things because those are a, there's a lot of hope in that. And it's really exciting to see mm -hmm. because after the long winter, suddenly we see these pops of color and the bees are getting busy. So, I mean, yeah. so very, very important. Yeah. I, re I remember too, as a kid, before I really understood anything, you know, or called it Wicca or whatever, I would bring into the house whatever was coming up in the spring because it was so exciting that mm -hmm. look something else is blooming. Of course, I killed whatever was blooming, <laughs> but you know, I didn't know I was a kid. But I would bring them in. I'd put the flowers in water. I'd make a big thing about it, and my mom encouraged that. And it was mm -hmm. it was kind of nice. It was like you know, okay, good. We're gonna put that on the dinner table. We're gonna we're gonna kind of celebrate that while we eat. So it was it was nice, you know. Yeah. And, and I have to say, using that, if, if you were to, for the next six months, really pay attention to what's going on around you outside, 
regardless of where you live. Notice what notice the plants you see, the colors around you, the vegetables that are in season. Yeah. Pay attention to that. That's really so very important and a great way to connect. Great yeah. way to connect. Yeah. And where, where I live, I do see a lot of animals. And I noticed I notice the birds. Because oh, yes. there's a change to the the, the birds that come around. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the telltale signs for me that things are really changing. Like a couple of weeks ago, not a couple of weeks ago, just last week, I just noticed I had been seeing for a while just tons of blue jays. I'm like, wow, is that like, are they like a spring bird? I think they're more a winter bird. But um, global global warming, whatever, they're becoming my spring bird. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you you say that because um, here in Ohio, it was warm enough for me to open windows for a couple of days before yeah. it dropped back down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but waking up and hearing all of the activity of the birds, it was like they're all out there building nests. They're talking to each other. They're gossiping. They're doing they're doing all of the things. It was a really lovely time, a, a lovely sound to wake up to, yeah. and I hadn't heard it. I yeah. Haven't. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. Um, yeah. Mainly the blue jays. Um, I always notice crows and ravens. They seem to follow me wherever <laughs> I go. So what does uh -huh. that tell you about me? Just kind of a dark person. But anyway, um, the um, little animals too. Like I haven't seen the chipmunks yet, but the squirrels are going bananas. The squirrels yes. are just running all over the place. And um, the other smaller animals, I guess I'll see them eventually, but noticing the squirrel activity is always exciting to me, kind of like my brothers, you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, thank you for being there and making me not feel alone. But, yes. but uh, yeah, I, I think the birds, though, are really, are really, really telltale of what's going on mm -hmm. with the season, what's changing. You know, yeah. you may not see the same birds all the time because of global warming. They're all confused and cattywampus. Yes. But I think that when you see a change in the types of flocks of birds that's that are coming around, that's really big. What I haven't seen in this area yet that I usually do see about a week before uh, the, the equinox is a robin. Haven't seen one robin really? yet. No, watch, watch, I'll go downstairs, I'll open the window and I'll see a robin. But yes. I have not seen one it's been those blue jays. So I don't Interesting. know. Interesting. We'll and see. see, and that's where I'm going. I wonder what the um, spirit animal information is about blue jays. Oh, I can tell you what it is. It's all about gossip and um, even bullying and ganging up on people and protecting oh. one's own, very territorial. That's mm -hmm. why probably uh, maybe I'm not seeing robins because of the blue jays because there's so many. I don't know. Mm. But yeah, you, blue jays and crows, when I first moved out here, uh, I, I looked them up. They're all of the Corvo or Corvid family, and uh -huh. um, they're very uh, clannish, you know? Okay. <laughs> yeah, clannish. yeah. Whereas ravens often go off on their own. I mean, they come back to the flock, but you, when you see crows, you'll usually see a murder of crows. When you yes. see ravens, you, you very often will see a single raven. So it's hmm. for me, I always note if I see multiple ravens, how many did I see? Because that number is right. going to be important. That's going to be important. And I I uh, like went out of my way to figure out, you know, so that I could visually figure out, is that a crow or a raven? And there are ways to figure it out. So that's great. Well, and that's one of those things, Colleen, you're bringing this you're bringing nature as a messenger to you because you're seeing the ravens and then you're counting them. So you're adding some of the numerology associated with it. Yes, absolutely. But that's so very important. So I think, you know, this is, this is a, um, this is a, this is a perfect time of the year to think about those new ideas. And if you want to do any spell work, prayers, promises, intention setting, Great time to do it. Yeah. Great, great time to do it. Yeah. Some of you who are watching, you may want to associate crystals with that. Oh, yes, you should. And yeah, yeah what crystals would you would you work with? What stones? Well, I would look at green stones first because you want to um, connect to that energy of growth, mm -hmm. um, that things are growing. Like I have, oh, I love this stone. 
I wish I could bring up the new one that I got at the shop yesterday, but this is a green calcite. Ooh, Absolutely beautiful. love this stone. I always keep this near me because, uh, you know, green stones, prosperity, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is a fluorite, a green fluorite. It comes kind of in a range, goes under purple even. So there's a green fluorite. I probably, oh, this is a cool one. This is um, this is probably fluorite, but it's just in a different form. It's a point, and yeah. then I have a whoops, bumped my camera. I brought this up just recently. This is a labradorite heart. Ooh, nice. It's a green, you can really see the green in it, and um, mm -hmm. I know it's labradorite. I know it's very, very green. It's not like an amazonite or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. the person that that I bought it from is a pretty knowledgeable gemologist, and they. They told me what that was. So, you know, yeah. I keep the, like my ring, I have a peridot. This is really the color, right? Yes. That's yeah. the color for me for spring. Mm -hmm. That peridot green, that lightish green. It yeah. is olive. It is an Kelly green. It is an emerald green. It's a very distinctive green. I mean, all of those greens are fine, but for stones, I'm looking at the peridot because that is yes. clear sightedness and, um, it does kind of bring in intuition a bit, but mm -hmm. it's, but it's, I think more a stone of clarity. Um, and for me, that's really important. So I love that yeah. being clear. Yeah. Cause it, you know, if you, if, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish your thought. <laughs> that um, when you go to um, aspire to something, when you're making these lists, um, you don't have to throw everything in the kitchen sink into the list. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much better to be a little more focused. Okay. Yes. Well, and, and I like how what you're saying is, is you're, you're selecting stones for their colors. You are also paying attention to the energy that that stone brings to what yeah. you're working. Yeah. So, so, you know, notice the color. Also pay attention to the energy that brings in. You know, like bloodstone, for instance, is a great stone that visually I wouldn't necessarily say is uh, Ostara or the spring equinox, but it's about life yeah. and life is returning. So it would be perfect for that. So, yeah, but, you know, and, and, and so that's something definitely to keep in mind. Yeah. Another, another couple of green stones that are really, I think visually exciting and beautiful is Malachite. Malachite mm -hmm. has that beautiful green color and the little, sometimes little swirlings of white in it. Um, also, um, there was one that, oh, serpentine. Serpentine Whoa. is a gorgeous stone. It's it's a dark green. It's actually green with flecks of black in it. And then sometimes you'll see that little red serpent going through it, that little line of red. And that's a stone that's more, I think, I think it's really good for workings because it has to do with the knowledge of a serpent. You know, and so if you're trying to tap into hidden knowledge and your own knowledge and gaining knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, serpentine is a really, really good uh, stone to to grab. But just in general, when you're looking at stones for o Ostara or for any purpose, you it, especially if you're I mean, you can do it online. I buy stones online. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. OK. Um, but if you're in a store or whatever you do need to just pay attention to what you're drawn to. Absolutely. Even if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I always get that color. It's just a pretty stone and I'm drawn to it. There's a reason you're drawn to that color. Take it, get that stone, get yes. multiples of that stone. Keep that stone in every room in your house. There's a reason that you need that stone. And in a few right. years, you may not need it and it'll just become a pretty stone in addition in your living room, But mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what has happened to me. <laughs> I've or it becomes a stone that is uh, that helps to keep the records of the experience that you've had. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. That's really, so, really great. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So I pulled up um, a, an article. Uh, believe it or not, the website is Learn Religions, and they're talking about the deities of the spring equinox. I just thought this was very interesting. Ooh. So we have um, Ashanti, which is... Um, Actually, the old name, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronouncement of it, is Asase Ya'a, which is Ashanti, Ashanti mm -hmm. uh, an earth goddess. In This is um, in Ghana. And her festival is called Durbar. 
And but okay. this is all about around the same time as as Eoster or Ostara. Um, Sybil in, for Romans, the mother goddess of Rome, was at the center of a rather bloody Phrygian cult in which eunuch priests performed mysterious rites in her honor. Okay, we don't need to talk about that right now. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, Sybil, all the mystery, all or, the mystery. Or, or Sibylle, if you want to pronounce it that way. Yes. Here's Eoster, and she's listed as Western Germanic. And it just says little is known about the worship of her. Um, and then Freya is Norse. So it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, Frigg. Freya was similar to Frigg, the mm -hmm. chief goddess of the Acer. And again, you have that kind of uh, sound, Acer, Easter, Oster. Yep. You know, you have that same kind of um, yes. linguistic root there that connects all of these things. Osiris for Egypt, Egypt. And I remember, mm -hmm. I think I did that when I did Ostar. I think I did a thing about Osiris. Oh, that was a fun meditation. That was cool. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> Saraswati would be the Hindu goddess for the. Uh, I love Saraswati. I do too. I love me some Saraswati. Um, uh, and in India, their rituals are called puja. And so they have uh, a puja for Saraswati called appropriately the Saraswati puja. Okay, <laughs> she's on it. Mm -hmm. so there's just a few from around the world. They didn't get it. Maybe there's more down here. Did I? Do they go into more? No, that was it. Okay, that's it. So it's just interesting to see that you know all around the world and all around the pantheons, there's something that goes on at the equinox. Everybody believes that it is a moment in time to be observed, and mm -hmm. I think that's really the bottom line essence of the whole thing, right? Yes. Well, and one of the things that um, is, I, I haven't mentioned this, but because it's a great time to start new things, um, this is a great time for, for people to consecrate their tools or their brews or their water, whatever they're going to use throughout the year. So it is a perfect time to honor and bless them. Your gardening tools, do that, uh, specifically your athame. It's because um, in my path, uh, Athame is associated with spring. Great time to do that. Um, and so, but think about that of, of different, different. Um, you could create tinctures in, in different, uh, with different um, um, herbs that you use. And, and the timing of that is really important because uh, it, it, that in my opinion is gets infused in the tincture and um, it certainly makes a difference. It makes yeah, a great difference. It really does. And um, for those of you who want to pay attention to the moon cycle in order to cleanse your stuff, I'll just get the dates up here for the next full and new moons and everything. So, if you're going to be cleansing things or just maybe dedicating a new tool to your, for your work, the next, let's see, today's uh, March 17th. So it would be March 21st would be when the uh, new moon is in Aries, but anytime from the 19th on, you could use that moon energy mm -hmm. and even probably, let's see, 123. You know what? The way this moon is traveling, you could probably even use that up to the 23rd because she's going to be she's going to be in Aries all that time. But you could start it because the equinox actually starts on the 19th. So, right. So yes. you could start things on the 19th, which is Tuesday, right? Yes. Well, Tuesday in North America. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you So anywhere from that Tuesday all the way up to Saturday. Uh, for cleansing your tools, which is good because you just reminded me. And I'm going to say cleanse your cleanse and clean up your altar too. You know, do I, a yes. thing. You know, do I will do that. I will. I will be ch um, cleaning my my working altar and switching out my uh, the chalices and the witch ball that I have on my altar. Yeah. Um, and dusting off my statuary because oh, it's wait. it's part of what I do. Back up. I was looking at last year's book. Hang uh -oh. on. Uh -oh. let, me, let me give you the dates for this year's part. My mistake. I was wondering why I didn't see the thing. Okay, scratch that. Back up, okay. mm -hmm. back up, back up, back up. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll. So, so I, I think the full moon is fine for cleansing things, but mm -hmm. I prefer the new moon. So I'm going to say now the full moon is March 25th, 
and that's in Libra. But again, a full moon is not going to, you know, it's a Libra moon. It's also an eclipse. So I don't know. The next thing is the new moon solar eclipse. It, it's up to you. March 25th is the lunar eclipse. Um, it's at 3 a.m. and that's going to be at five degrees Libra. So you're probably going to have from the 25th, which is um, a week from tomorrow. That's the Monday, a week from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you could probably you could probably do something the night before, like if you needed to do it on a Sunday, it'd be okay. But the real energy is going to be on the 25th and the 26th. 27th it's going to be too late it's going to it's going yeah. to be kind of out of the energy yeah. so that monday tuesday is really the peak time and then for the solar eclipse new moon in aries that's april 8th and that's going to be let me just go to the april calendar here come on there we go i went the wrong way okay so that starts at 19 degrees aries on april 8th so you could do stuff starting on maybe even Saturday the 6th that evening mm -hmm. up to maybe Tuesday morning the 9th because it's nice. within Aries and that's when you're going to get all that energy. Now, there are other ways to cleanse your tools, you know, mm -hmm. you can leave, it doesn't have to be moonlight. You can leave them in the sunlight. Yes. You can, you can rinse them under running water if it won't make the like stones or whatever dissolve. You can just hold them under running water you can place them in a bowl of water that mm -hmm. you you yourself have consecrated just with your hands and saying a few words and you know you can say you know i'm blessing this water please clean my tools and yes. bless these tools for whatever intention i'm going to be using them for you fill in the blanks but you yep. don't have to wait for the moon to do that kind of cleansing no and intention is everything you can do that at any time the supplemental energy just just augments what you've done it's the yeah. support of it so absolutely yeah. yeah and then i would do the same thing with your crystals that you're going to be using mm -hmm. now you don't have to cleanse things like herbs or anything but the containers that you put them in should be blessed if not yes. cleansed now i'm not a big one on like things where where i use a bowl or a little mini cauldron or something for burning things I'm not big on cleaning those out. I think the 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 ashes and the stuff that forms in the bottom of that bowl is kind of my history. And yeah. I kind of I kind of like it there. I do too. So for those things, I just tap everything out. I'll give the outside of that container a little wipe if I think it needs it, and I'll mm -hmm. call it a day. I'm not putting yeah. that in water. I'm not destroying those beautiful no. ashes. But the things that go in it, like incense and herbs and stuff, that doesn't need to be cleansed either because you're burning it. The fire is cleansing it as it burns. So just be, kind of use your head with this stuff. You're going to cleanse things that can be washed, basically. And just be mm -hmm. careful of your stones that might be soft enough that they dissolve in water, Absolutely. like selenite. Like we don't do that with mm -hmm. selenite. And that's another way to cleanse your stones, by the way, is just to have a piece of selenite there amongst your stones. You got it. Keeps them constantly clean. You got it. So that's the housekeeping for Ostara. <laughs> I would, I would too, if you, if on your altar, if you have candles that are like halfway burnt down, um, if you have stones that are broken, um, you don't have to replace them, but for me personally, little moon in Virgo here, um, I replace the candles and mm -hmm. I have one of one of the women in our coven is um, she has this thing. She's like, you don't put leave the candles out if they've never been lit. And I'm like, yeah, but they're brand new candles. I don't want them to be all dripping because you don't have to let it drip. Just cut the wick to the right length, light it and pinch it out. Mm. I was like, why? And she goes, it's bad luck. Otherwise, I'm like, ah, uh, okay. okay, whatever. Okay. So so I always do that, too. But mm -hmm. You know, and, and the candle holders, if you're using candle holders, like I have these big candle holder things, you know, take the old crap off of them, take the yes. old wax off, you know, do a little housekeeping there and uh, just use your head about how you're cleaning things. Well, and certainly as you're doing that cleaning of them, the housekeeping of them, setting the, the you know, thinking about what it is that you're wanting to encourage for the next six months really makes a difference. You have every opportunity. You can take the most mundane thing and add an element of magic to it, 
magic, intention setting, you know, light, whatever you want to call it. Think about that. Keep, you know, play some music that lifts your spirits, that focuses you in on that. It's perfect for, for when you're doing all of that stuff. And likewise, as you're cleaning off the old crap, you're letting go. Yep. So that's another intention. Like if you're do if you're cleaning the wax off your candle holders, you're letting go of all those old things. So anything you were disappointed in, anything that you felt like it didn't work right, mm -hmm. anything like you felt you were taken advantage of, just say to yourself that that's all good, just going in the garbage as you clean this right. all off. You know, use that exercise as an intentional exercise to yes. let go and set up the new. It, it feels great. It really does. It And Gerald's right. When you, when you combine your intention with these exercises of cleaning and letting go and putting in new things, it really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. it, it makes a huge, it feel it literally, you'll feel the energy because you guys are all empaths anyway. So yeah. <laughs> you're going to feel all that shit. There. Well, and, and you, you know, and, and I still love that idea is, is, you know, go buy a composition book you know, one of those dollar fifty ninety nine cent things, um, and start to write down what you're noticing. You know, and if you you know on the on the equinox, a great thing to do is is to take a walk to notice what's going on with nature around where you live. I mean, you may live in a in a concrete jungle. Um, still go around and go with that honoring and noticing what's coming up. If you can get your feet in some grass and you see some some flowers, that's a good thing. But getting out and starting to go, oh, I can be out of the house. Because trust me, we need to be out of the house. We it's been crazy. So yeah. Yeah. But. Oh, all these wonderful. Now, now I have to go downstairs and clean all my altars. And there's, <laughs> there's a bunch in my house. I'm gonna be busy the rest of the afternoon. Yes, 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 yes. And um, I was actually thinking about uh, making some black salt on uh, the equinoxes. Or no, on the, uh, um, yeah, eclipses. Oh, that is a good idea. And, oh, um, you know, oh, because yeah. we're in the path, partial path of um, the, um, the, you know, the one in April. So I'm like, ooh, yeah, here we go. Very nice. I'm I love it. That Colleen's down. writing that down. Everybody. I am writing it down. That and, is great. Because uh, yeah. now I know how to make black salt. Yes. Yes, yes, Yay. yes. Yay. And if you're cleaning out all of your cauldrons and with ashes, save them. Save those ashes. Yep. I know people think I'm crazy, but I save all that stuff. It makes a difference. It, uh, it makes does. a huge difference. It does. makes a huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Oh, I think we covered it, don't you? I think it was wonderful, yes. Wow. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you for talking. Thank you for inspiring me with all sorts of other goofy things to talk about. I love this. This is great. <laughs> this is really great. The news shaman said, what is black salt? What's black uh, salt? You need to watch uh, Tara Stash's little video on, what was that? What was the video called? It was, I think it was a laugh and learn black salt. Yeah. He has to laugh and learn about black salt. And that's where I learned about it because I was buying it from stupid people. You know, now I don't have to. <laughs> and um, well, you know what? I think I can. I'll put a link in. Great. If Please I can do that. So, yeah. Okay. I will do that. I'll put that link in. Okay. That's wonderful. Well, I think, you know, we've kind of covered the waterfront here on Ostara. And um, thanks, Gerald, for bringing me back from the edge a couple of times there, where the, <laughs> where the discussion kind of went. <laughs> it was fun. I enjoyed it. And uh, we've got some more topics that we can talk about beyond just the Sabbaths. Yes, we do. We do. We, we need so. to do that. So. All right. So with that, I'm going to say thanks, everybody in the chat. You are just so amazing and you have great information. And I just love everything that you're saying, especially um, Cat Mama, because she keeps telling me that I look pretty. Um. <laughs> Duh. Of course you do. <laughs> oh, God. So we're going to call it a day here. And um, gosh, look at all this. Oh, I want to go back and read all of these things. 
Um, Chris Cassidy, what do you do with black salt? A lot of things. Go watch the video. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of things. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's extremely effective. Yes, it is. Especially if you make it yourself. Uh, yes. Okay, yes. you guys. Gerald and I were just discussing. We we really need to make an intro and outro video for these uh, witchy <laughs> witchy uh, witchy videos, but um, someday we will because we both like to do that sort of thing. Yes. All right. Um, love you all in the chat, Gerald. Love you. Love Looking you too. To seeing you again real soon. Oh wait, it's tomorrow, isn't it? It's tomorrow for okay. um, caffeinated and unfiltered. Yeah. Tune in. Yeah, so we're going to be on caffeinated, caffeinated and unfiltered. I think I need some caffeine in order to do that. Um, yes, I would highly recommend that. Yeah, it has to happen. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.